Hello friends, I'm Dee, about to react to another vid by Nick Crowley. People have requested that I watch this one. It's titled, The Darkest Moments in TV History. The other time we reacted to uh, the worst parts of the internet, something like that. It was it was disturbing, but interesting, okay? <laughs> so now we're gonna see what these dark moments in, in TV history are like. Let's watch. Now which of these ways would you choose to reveal your secret crush on someone? A, would you write that personal letter? It's March 6th, 1995, as taping begins on an all-new episode of The Jenny Jones Show. The program was essentially a tabloid talk show centered around everyday people caught up in unusual circumstances, which made for an entertaining, yet often questionable program, with the showrunners doing everything in their power to make the content as shocking and sensational yeah. as possible. In this episode, it was said to be no different. The segment centered around six people, each of whom had a secret admirer, who would be revealed for the very first time here on the show, with the most compelling of the group by far shaping up to be 24-year-old Jonathan Schmitz. Like the others, someone had a long-standing crush like on Jonathan, but was too afraid to tell him. And upon hearing of this, Jonathan hoped in the back of his mind that it would be his longtime ex-girlfriend, who he had a newfound interest in marrying, though he was in for quite a shock. The twist in the episode was that Jonathan's secret admirer was actually a man named Scott Amador. The two were actually good friends, though Scott had never once mentioned having any sort of romantic interest in him, due to the fact that Jonathan was straight and had never given any sort of indication otherwise, setting the scene this for what was surely going him. to be a shocking reveal. A reveal that the crowd just couldn't wait to see. B, would you tell the person in private in case he rejects you? Or C, would you tell that person that you're gay and you hope he is on national television? Oh, bad idea. No. Scotty. I'll see where this is going. The host, Jenny Jones, starts by talking to Scott and a mutual friend, inquiring as to how this crush began in the first place. Why don't you now to meet Donna and Scott? Now, Donna has been helping Scott pursue his secret crush Donna, you ain't shit. John's backstage. He can't hear us. How, how bad is the crush? Tell me about the first time you met him. Where, where was he? Uh, well, basically, well, he was under a car, working on her brake line. Yeah. And that was your first time? What was your first impression? Um, well, I only saw the lower half. I'm thinking of that. Before she begins to dig even deeper, pushing Scott to disclose as much graphic personal information as possible, just to make things that much more entertaining, and his answers did not disappoint. Do okay, you think about it? You have fantasies about him? I've had a couple, yeah. Yeah, you had one. You had when you go to the car. You had a fantasy about him. Yeah, something to do with like brake oil, line snapping, and. <laughs> you have another one uh, that involved you were in a hammock or something. Tell us about that fantasy. Yeah, I Jenny, you I also are not hammock. shit, lady. Uh, she lost <laughs> With all of Scott's secrets now out in the open, it was time to bring out the man himself, the object of Scott's affection, who had absolutely no idea what he was walking into. Let's have John come out here and see who has the crush on him. Here's John. Yeah. And you did all that? No. You're done, buddy. Sorry, RP. This was the pivotal moment of the show, the big reveal, and perhaps overcome by the excitement of the ratings that she assumed this would bring her, Jenny Jones could hardly wait to blurt out who Jonathan's admirer truly was. Did you think Donna had the crush on you? Did I? No, we're good friends. Well, guess what? It's Scott that has the crush on you. You lied to me. <laughs> oh, maybe not. Jonathan's reaction was certainly one of shock, but the host wasn't quite satisfied, having one more trick up her sleeve in order to garner an even stronger reaction, as she gives the producers the cue to replay Scott's segment, where he discussed his fantasies in depth. Uh, before we talk, take a look at, we'll show a little bit back on what uh, Scott said about you, uh, John. Take a look at that oh, one right here. <laughs> well, it entails like whipped cream and champagne and stuff like that. probably laughing now but it's not he thinking and from here the segment comes to a close with jonathan reaffirming that he is in fact straight thus dashing scott's hopes of ever dating the man did you have any idea that he liked you this much um no 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 <laughs> can you tell us what your status is are you involved with anybody or um no but i am uh, definitely a heterosexual i guess you could say <laughs> leaving the two to head off stage and deal with the messy aftermath of a revelation like this, done on a no, stage like that. Me. 
But despite the obvious awkwardness, it actually seemed like both parties took it pretty well, with Jonathan even taking Scott out for dinner that very night to smooth things over, where he again stated that he so was he flattered, but just not interested. This is a setup. However, this civility wouldn't last long. Three days later. Okay, calm down, okay? Okay, why did you do that? Oh, no. If y'all can't see, he said because he picked on me on national television and he's a homosexual. Damn, I knew where it was going, but I was hoping, I was kind of hoping I was wrong. Damn. Yeah, why would they? Y'all are responsible. Cause that is that's embarrassing for him when he's straight and then he got his other friends like cracking jokes and you know back in the nineties people way way more homophobic than they are now. People are hella homophobic today. So just imagine back then how bad it was. So he, this is like the worst thing that could have happened. Fucking Jenny. That's not Though cool. Though we didn't say it at the time, the truth was that Jonathan was left shaken and embarrassed by what had happened on the Jenny Jones show. And despite the fact that the program at this cool, point man. hadn't even aired yet, it was weighing heavily on his mind, just knowing that it would soon be seen by people he knew. And this feeling was only intensified due to the fact that Scott was seemingly not taking no for an answer. Leaving a note on Jonathan's door just three days later, writing, if you want to turn this off, you'll have to use a tool. It takes a special tool. This note no, was his breaking me. point. The moment Jonathan read it was the moment he made his mind up. He was going to kill Scott Amador. He left his house right then and there and purchased a shotgun, which he used to break down Scott's door, approaching the man and firing two shots at point blank range, both of which connected, killing Scott instantly. With his mission accomplished, Jonathan sped away from the scene, calling the police shortly after and confessing to everything, stating his sole motivation for doing this being the humiliation he felt from Scott's own confession on that TV show, as well as his continued flirtation despite Jonathan's obvious disinterest. Though clearly this was no excuse to kill, and as a result, Jonathan was arrested and given 22 years in prison, from which he was released back in 2017. Oh, you look crazy now. Due to the fallout from this episode, it was pulled from the lineup before it even made it to air. But today, the full recording can be found across the internet, giving us a look at the stage on which a killer was made, and a scene that has now become immortalized as one of the darkest moments in television history. Damn. You, you, you cannot play with like that. It's not small. I'm not excusing what he did, obviously. But... The situation. R.I.P. The internet is a dark place, and lurking around every corner are companies trying to steal and exploit our data. This is the of everybody around the great that have been from very unapt data breaks. Not of July 4th, the family went to bed as usual. By the early hours. Of... Okay, I'll just read it and, and mute it because y'all probably can't hear us both. Okay. On the night of July 4th, the family went to bed as usual. By the early hours of July 5th, something unexpected had happened. At around 5.30 in the morning, I woke up to find that she was gone. It had been 11 long excruciating days since 55-year-old Shu Guli had last seen his wife, Lai Hueli, who had vanished from their apartment in the dead of night. So now, desperate for help tracking her down, he, he took her. to the local news stations, putting out a public plea for any information that could help bring her home. Her disappearance occurred on the 4th of July, 2020, which also happened to be oh. their daughter's 11th birthday. That's so old. To celebrate, Shu made the family a special meal, including his daughter's favorite, meatballs, cooking the entire recipe from scratch, even grinding the beef at home. The dinner was supposedly a success, and to finish things off, Lai and her daughter enjoyed a tall glass of milk poured by Shu before the family turned in for the night. Hours later, in the dead of night, Shu woke to use the restroom, and upon getting back into bed, he briefly watched his wife as she was sleeping peacefully next to him. Before he fell back asleep, he would never see. I clearly got my dates mixed up. I don't. 
Just because I feel like they said 2005, and then I heard 2020. Error again. I'm tired. I'm not rewinding it, though. Well, 24 okay. hours later, Ai Hui Li was officially reported missing, and a full-blown investigation into her whereabouts was launched, which is where things begin to get strange. When police searched the apartment complex, they noted a large number of security cameras positioned all over the property, both inside and outside of the building making it all but certain that Lai would be seen in the footage at some point leaving the apartment, which would at least give investigators a timeline as to when she left. The footage first shows Lai and her daughter taking the elevator up what to their apartment at 5.04 p.m., which was presumably right before their meal. From there, That's over 6,000 hours of footage would be reviewed frame by frame, though strangely, Lai was never pictured again. <laughs> to investigators, this was impossible. The cameras covered every single possible exit, and it was shown that not a single route would have made her completely undetectable to them, which quite simply meant that she could not have left the building. She had to be somewhere inside. And so they searched everywhere in that complex, from the unit she lived in, to the AC vents, the water tanks, storage units, everywhere. Though still, they found nothing. Lai was gone, but at the same time, she clearly hadn't left. It was no wonder why Xu felt so helpless in the situation, and fearing that they were reaching a dead end, he began what essentially became his media tour, as he attempted to get as many eyes as possible onto the case in order to help find his wife. Xu Jianru said, "On the 5th of May, at 12:30 p.m., he was sleeping on the bed. His wife was still there. At 5:00 p.m., the bed was empty. He left only one person. I don't know if she was missing. I don't know if she was missing. Has this happened before? No. I was thinking about what will happen to my daughter and my wife. Like, will my wife come back? Is she dead or alive? I don't know. Around 7 30, I woke up my daughter because she was in the next room. I asked if she had seen her mother. And she said she hadn't. Again, I didn't think much of it. I thought it was fine. She went out in the morning. So I continue with my own task. These media appearances began to happen numerous times a day across essentially any station that would allow him on. Though even when this failed to garner any leads, he kept the pressure on the public. This time, by announcing a reward of 100,000 yen for anyone with information that could help lead to her discovery. Meanwhile, investigators kept digging, searching the area again and again. But still, it just wasn't adding up. There was no way out of that building that hadn't well, been that's only a few hundred dollars. Well, except for one. In what was likely a last-ditch idea, one of the investigators had a hunch that they should check the community septic tank, Look as it. that was really the only place that hadn't been thoroughly picked enough. over yet. And so dozens of trucks moved in to sift through weeks of raw sewage. They I'm searched for 25 hours like, with a like <laughs> filth and unbearable stench, until they found something. It was an unusual gooey mass that no one could seem to identify, and wanting to know more, they brought the substance back to the lab for testing, only to discover that they had essentially just solved the case. They had found Lai. Mm. Or at least what remained of her. Despite the story she had told investigators and the media, things didn't actually happen the way he said they did on that fateful night. Instead, the couple had actually gotten into an argument after she would cut his hand while preparing the meatballs, to which he blamed his wife for the injury, causing the two to have a verbal spat. This was supposedly nothing uncommon for the pair, as the marriage had allegedly turned sour years before due to financial strain, mm -hmm. meaning that this was far from their first fight, though it would be their last. When Shu handed his wife and daughter their milk for the night, each tall glass had actually been laced with sleeping medication, with the drug immediately taking effect and knocking both of them out. Oh. And with the house now silent, he smothered Lai with a pillow, thus ending her life. But if this was the case, then how did she end up in the septic tank? Well, Shu had a plan. He had previously purchased several large butcher knives, which he used to cut his wife into smaller pieces. However, this still wasn't enough for him, as he wanted to make sure that every trace would be discarded in the most effective way possible. And so, he turned to the kitchen, and more specifically, the area he had prepared the meatballs in earlier, before proceeding to place her remains through the meat grinder. Oh no. Turning Lai into an unrecognizable mass of flesh that he would then methodically flush down the toilet over the course of many hours. Despite playing the role of a loving oh, husband and even a victim across his television interviews, this man had actually not only killed his wife, but desecrated her remains in a horrendous fashion. And looking back at some of his answers, it's honestly not all that surprising. 
我这么多年在这跟他走下去了，哎，对他了解，他是出不去的，就是。There's no way she could have gotten out alone, given her intelligence. And my understanding of her over the years, honestly, she couldn't have done it alone. As a result of his crimes, Shugulai would be sentenced to death, with his execution being set to happen in the near future. September twenty seventh, two thousand seven. Cameras document an unfolding protest in Yangon, Myanmar, as thousands of people take to the streets to express their displeasure with their government. The demonstration was part of an emerging struggle later known as the Saffron Revolution, with tensions having risen in the month prior when the government made the decision to remove subsidies on the price of gasoline, thus causing gas prices to inflate overnight by over sixty percent, throwing the economy into instant turmoil. In response, this saffron revolution began, which was largely spearheaded by the monks of the region, who all preached a peaceful protest, believing that the government would soon come to its senses when they saw that their citizens were unified against them. However, the government showed no signs of letting up. In fact, on this day, they had actually begun taking offensive measures, going as far as to arrest hundreds of monks in response to their picketing. For the residents, this display was shocking, as they struggled to understand how their own government could jail these religious figures. But they had no idea just how much crueler they could get. As the demonstrators marched in the street that day, a line of officers announced that they had ten minutes to go home, or else they would face dire punishment. But the crowd refused to back down, being intent on marching on to let the world know just how serious they were. And with neither side willing to budge, the officers began to fire their weapons, first into the air as a warning, and then directly at the protesters. Was a massacre, with the official death toll being ten innocent civilians, while others on site that day posited that the number was likely much higher. The footage is disturbing on its own, but there was another layer to this ordeal, one unexpected variable: a man named Kenji Nagai. Nagai was a journalist from Japan with a lengthy track record of reporting on situations in dangerous, even war-torn countries, building up an impressive resume in the journalism community. And during the Saffron Revolution, he was visiting the region with his camera to document the events firsthand, as he had done with so many conflicts before. Yet, despite having so-called special protection due to his journalist status, Kenji never made it back home. With Myanmar officials reporting that he had accidentally been struck in the chest by a stray bullet, making him the only foreign casualty in this ordeal. The revelation was obviously heartbreaking for his family and for the entire country of Japan, who strongly condemned the slaying of Kenji as well as the slaying of the other protesters. But still, officials in Myanmar asserted that this was all just an unfortunate accident, a classic case of a man being in the wrong place at the wrong time. But this was only the beginning of the story. Days later, the Japanese media would receive a video recording of the bloodshed that occurred on that notorious day, when the streets of Yangon turned into a one-sided battlefield, and the contents were alarming to say the least. The footage shows a crowd of people desperately running for their lives. When in the corner of the frame, you can see a man dressed in white, holding a camera as he falls to the ground. It was Kenji Nagai, and he hadn't tripped or even been shot at this point. But instead, he was seen being pushed by a soldier, a soldier who now pointed his weapon at the man who was now lying helplessly on the ground, and fired a shot directly into his chest, leaving him there to die. Following this, a separate photographer on the scene managed to capture an image of Kenji moments after the attack, and in the photo, Nagai was still holding onto his camera, documenting the carnage around him as he lay there bleeding to death, having taken a bullet directly into his heart. The revelation was shocking for a few reasons. 
Most obviously, it disproved the initial claims that Kenji Nagai had been shot by a stray bullet, as this was clearly and quite literally an execution. But it also showed the entire world these harrowing yet inspiring images of a fearless, passionate journalist who continued documenting the battle around him, even as the life left his body, with his corpse being shown minutes later still holding on to that camera. Which leaves us with one burning question. What happened to that camera? Kenji Nagai had quite literally given his life to capture the images on that device. And with the man being so close to the action, it was likely that whatever was on that camera was incredible. And perhaps even showed his execution up close, which could give more details about how exactly his passing came to be. Yet when his body was returned back to his family in Japan, that camera was nowhere to be found, despite it being in his hands when he passed. Had it been left behind, was it destroyed in the carnage? Well, it wouldn't take long for these two questions to be answered, as more footage of the event would soon emerge, again on Japanese television. The clip appeared to show one of the soldiers responsible for Kenji's death, going in and physically prying the camera from the dead man's hand. Mm. And from that point on, it had never been seen again. And with that, one of the most unique lost media searches of all time was underway. And this wasn't an example of lost media that's better off staying lost either, as Kenji's own family was desperate to get this camera back in order to showcase his final images to the world. And so they put out various requests, pleas, and even started a petition, begging the government of Myanmar to turn the camera over, assuming that they were the ones who oh, held it in their possession. Though despite the immense public pressure throughout the years, nothing ever came of their pleas. In fact, not only did the Myanmar government refuse to give it up, but they continued to assert that Kenji's death was nothing more than an innocent accident. And for many years, it would remain this way. Until out of nowhere, a full decade and a half later. Oh, they found the camera? Oh! Oh! Fifteen years later? Wait, who was keeping it? A press conference was held with the family of Kenji Nagai, as the camera was finally returned to their possession. The story of how this camera got back to them is almost entirely a mystery. A group called the Democratic Voice of Burma was involved in some capacity, though they credited an unnamed individual as the catalyst behind its recovery, with many believing that this person had likely stolen the camera from the government and smuggled it out of Myanmar. But aside from the speculation, no further information was provided, which was probably done to ensure the safety of the individual involved. And despite having no confirmation as to where this camera had actually been, the family finally had it in their possession after 15 long years. Saying, you know. And they've actually gone on to release bits and pieces of the footage from that day to the media, which finally gives us a look into some of Kenji's final moments. <laughs> Moments after pointing out the military that had moved in to quell the protest, Kenji was executed by one of those very soldiers. It's unclear how much more footage was actually on that camera, but for the time being, this is all that's been released to the public, and it's likely to remain that way forever. Today, his family hopes that this footage will help highlight the fact that the problems in Myanmar are actually still very prevalent, with the civil unrest continuing to lead to the deaths of hundreds, even thousands of people per year. As for many of the citizens, the battle rages on. Though in a somewhat poetic fashion, the recovery of Kenji's camera actually brought the situation back into the news cycle, meaning that even after his death, Kenji Nagai continues to make a difference. Damn, that's really sad. <laughs> It was always a big deal when Wet and Das would go on air. After all, it was far and away the most popular show in all of Europe, drawing in millions of viewers to see what crazy segments the show would come up with. 
The premise of the show was that the contestants were given various unusual challenges that they would attempt to complete in front of a live television audience, with these challenges always being somewhat tailored to the contestants' lives. Though these silly challenges would usually be contrasted by someone attempting something a bit more daring, with these stunts often being reserved for people with some sort of special training beforehand to assure that they were physically and mentally up to the task in order to avoid injury. The show was very intriguing, with an air of fun and danger all rolled into one, as you never really knew what you were going to get when you tuned in, leading to their program pulling okay. roughly 20 million viewers per episode at its peak which was also helped by the A-list celebrities that often made appearances. Oh. And on December 4th, 2010, the okay. lineup was particularly stacked, with Cameron Diaz they being featured so. as well as Justin Bieber, who was set to perform in front of the millions watching at home. But first, things would start off with a stunt, a stunt performed by 23-year-old Samuel Cock. Samuel was a stuntman and actor in training, already having one stunt credit to his name and a vast amount of training under his belt, making him the perfect candidate to perform something more dangerous and physically demanding. With this in mind, Samuel was given the task of jumping over five moving cars, each of which progressively getting longer and harder to clear. And in order to help make things a bit easier, he was given spring-loaded boots, or kangaroo shoes, which would allow him to jump higher. Like the stunt was right on the border of Samuel's capabilities, as during his practice runs, he was just able to clear most of the vehicles, mm -hmm. though not without falling multiple times, making it a true challenge, which was what the show was all about. And at Samuel's request, his segment would open the show, with his mother watching from the stands, having a microphone attached to her, ready to capture her reaction. The first jump goes off cleanly, making it obvious that Samuel could actually do this. Though, when approaching the second car... Can y'all still air it Samuel bails out, feeling as though something wasn't quite right with his approach. This meant that he would now have to execute the next three jumps without fail, or else he would lose the bet. And with the pressure mounting as the third car approached... just two yeah, jumps away yeah. from winning the prize. Though waiting for him inside that fourth car was a surprise. The drivers of these vehicles weren't just employees of the show, they were actually people Samuel knew, all of which had been good friends of his up until this point. What? But for the fourth car, with the pressure way. already on, it would be his own father behind the wheel. They both look oh, at each other from God. afar as Samuel raises his hand and his father raises his back do this. as the two begin towards each other. I'll be like, look, you can do what you want. I don't recommend you do it. I think this is dumb. I think you got a death wish, but I ain't getting behind the wheel. I ain't involved. Why would you? Stunt man or not, experience or not, I don't care. I'll be like, nope, nope. Because anything can happen. I'm not driving no car that's coming at you to hit you. Whew. Samuel jumps, but immediately something is wrong. He's just a bit too low causing the back of his head to make contact with the windshield. From the footage, it looks like just a graze, so insignificant that you might miss it. But in reality, it's believed that in this moment, Samuel hit his head in such a way that he was knocked unconscious, leaving him in the air with no way of staking his landing. And with that, he I'm falls to the head. ground, unable to protect himself, landing directly onto his face, with his mother's microphone briefly capturing her initial reaction. The camera cuts to one of the judges, whose face tells us just how bad the scene is. Samuel isn't moving, and is totally unresponsive. Even as his mother runs from the stands to comfort him, he doesn't move an inch. Even worse, the program was beloved due to the fact that they aired no commercials. It was a live feed for as long as three hours, meaning that they had no commercial break to cut to. And remember, this was the very first segment. This is terrible.
Instead, the cameras show the audience, all of whom were standing there stunned in complete silence as paramedics rush in to help the man. It would be several excruciating minutes before the host, Thomas Gottschalk, announced that the show would be canceled for the evening, ending the program early for the very first time in its history. Thank you, bis gleich, hoffentlich. Why would that, no, everybody got home. Why would that With the host being so shaken by what he had witnessed he that he resigned immediately after the show. The good news was Samuel was alive, oh, good. though he was in rough shape. Okay. Two of his cervical vertebrae had been fractured and his spinal cord was badly damaged, which left him fully paralyzed from the neck down, oh. turning him instantly into a quadriplegic. Oh. And what makes the situation that much more depressing was that, again, his the father was driving. the one driving, likely leaving him with unimaginable guilt, despite the fact that it clearly wasn't his fault. But despite this awful tragedy, Samuel's story is actually quite inspiring in the end, as he's gone on to become a successful actor, and even has a credit as an assistant director, taking what was quite possibly the worst hand he could have ever been dealt with, and going out there and achieving his dreams regardless. Though meanwhile, Wet and Das never really recovered from the incident, and would be cancelled just a few years later due to low ratings, with the most popular episode after the incident being one where Samuel himself actually made an appearance, where he forgave the show and claimed that what happened to him was not their fault. Though it seems the general public was I mean, able. technically, no, because somebody forcing him to do this, you could argue that, but come on, y'all encouraging the shit, y'all broadcasting the shit, you got a whole audience watching, y'all, ah, we're entertained by the danger! So, miss me with that, bro. Like, I, I feel like everybody failed him, and he failed himself because he shouldn't have done it. Obviously, obviously, a grown man, make your own decisions. But just, I don't understand people being entertained by shit like this. Like, what? Forget that horrific moment they had all witnessed on live TV. Glad he, he didn't uh, pass, though. At least he made it. This is the last uh, story. There's one magical, haunted evening each year when all the scary creatures come out to prowl through every neighborhood. Haunted? It's Halloween night, 1992. People across the UK are just getting home and settling in for the night, with many deciding to turn on their television in search of some spooky content to fit the mood, only to find a rather surprising option from an even more surprising source. Well, I think a magical, I think of something positive. Like, <laughs> you know, you think of like the Christmas movies and they have magical things happen. Like, what's the miracle on 28th Street? Whatever that shit is called, that old ass movie. <laughs> I didn't think of like magic and I don't even know if magic's in that movie. That was the first thing I thought of. But you think of magic, you know, in like, oh, an exciting, charming way. Positivity. Halloween. Haunting. Chilling. Scary. Dark. Even if magic is occurring, like black magic or whatever, it's still. I don't think of that magic. The BBC. They were airing a new special yeah. called Ghost Watch, a daring mission that followed famed BBC presenter Michael Parkinson and a team of reporters as they aimed to capture definitive proof of the existence of ghosts <laughs> and add another layer of tension they would attempt to do so live on TV. At the time, this was extremely unique, especially for the BBC, which was known to be one of the most trusted news stations in the UK. And making things even more interesting, they weren't going to be doing their investigation at a well-known haunted destination, but rather a simple suburban home a home inhabited by a family and what they claim to be an intense, even violent spirit named Bro, Mr. Pipes. The name was given because the spirit produced loud banging noises, which the mother initially believed to be the home's old water pipes. The mother's name was Pamela Early, and she lived in the home with her two daughters, Suzanne and Kim. And for months, they had been desperately trying to get the media's attention to help with these hauntings. However, most reporters who visited the scene labeled them as crazy. And so this was their moment to prove to the world that these paranormal occurrences were in fact real. Though early on, most viewers were left feeling the exact opposite way. Inside the home, reporter Sarah Green would experience essentially no activity for the first hour, with Michael Parkinson and a skeptic they had brought on for an interview casting serious doubt that the phenomena experienced inside the home prior was anything supernatural, instead blaming these supposed occurrences on psychological issues. And things only got worse from here, as upon hearing Mr. Pipe's infamous banging noises, Sarah actually caught Suzanne making the sounds herself by hitting a hammer against the wall, wow. essentially disproving the entire story of the house. Quite extraordinary. We set out to catch a ghost, and, and sadly, very sadly, what we witnessed was a remarkable exposure of a hoax. That's not me too hasty. Oh, come on, Doctor, please. We... It was a rough showing. However, by the show's final hour, things began to take an unexpected turn. 
Suddenly, the show cuts to Suzanne, who is lying unresponsive in her bedroom, completely covered in scratches, thrusting the broadcast into utter chaos. Are you well, Why are we going? Just outside. Are we going? As they rush to help her, loud banging noises emanate from all across the home, despite the fact that everyone was now accounted for. It was horrifying, and made even more so as the camera shows Suzanne hiding behind a couch. Susan. Stop it! Stop it, Susie! Where she begins to speak in a low, unrecognizable voice, almost as if she yeah, was possessed. Now, in case you haven't caught on yet, Ghostwatch is a work of fiction. The entire show was actually a staged pre-recorded movie, with everyone you see here being actors, except for Michael Parkinson, who was actually a presenter of the BBC, who was used to make the movie look as authentic as possible in order to terrify the viewers. In fact, the show had even started with a brief disclaimer, explaining that this was all going to be a staged performance. Now, on BBC One, Screen One presents an unusual and sometimes disturbing film marking Halloween. Using the modern idiom of the outside broadcast, Michael Parkinson, Sarah Green, Mike Smith, and Craig Charles star in Ghost Watch. But the problem was, most people didn't see this. And with the movie aiming to look as authentic as possible, many just took it at face value and truly believed that they were watching an actual real-life possession unfolding before their eyes. And the program wasn't over either. I won't spoil too much of the film, but from this point on, everything is chaotic and extremely tense, leading to the revelation being made that through this program, they had essentially just performed one massive seance, which left each of the 11 million viewers watching at home supposedly susceptible to demonic possession, with the program ending with Michael Parkinson himself becoming possessed. <laughs> What keeps working? Round and round the garden, like a teddy bear. After which the camera shuts off and Ghost Watch comes to an end. The program immediately caused widespread panic, with the network receiving over 30,000 phone calls that night, okay. most of which coming from horrified viewers. Even Parkinson's own mother phoned the show in hysterics as she genuinely believed her son had been possessed and potentially even killed. The stories from that night are incredible, with one woman calling the show and demanding compensation for a new pair of trousers, as her husband had quite literally defecated himself out of fear, as well as two boys who presented to their doctors with symptoms of PTSD. It was complete and utter madness, but of all the reactions to Ghost Watch, one individual took it the hardest. Among the 11 million viewers watching was an 18-year-old named Martin Denham, who was tuning in from his family's living room with his parents and younger sister. As the show progressed, Michael began acting strangely, curling up into a ball and becoming unresponsive. All the while, his eyes stayed locked on the screen, watching these horrific events unfold, with his family describing it as if he had been hypnotized. Now, Martin did suffer from a learning disability, which apparently affected his behavior at times, but this was something entirely new. Starting that night, he was overcome with intense paranoia as he began hearing noises around the house, which his parents recognized as the water pipes. This explanation only increased Martin's fear, however, as this was the exact excuse the mother had used on Ghost Watch to initially explain the paranormal phenomena. And so each time he heard these deep thudding noises, he believed they were coming from Mr. Pipes, with a spirit infiltrating his home thanks to that cursed show that he still believed to be real. Over the next few days, Martin refused to spend any time in the dark, and even asked to switch bedrooms as he believed Mr. Pipes was hiding in his walls. But nothing could alleviate his panic. It was all just too much. So you often feel? Five days after Ghost Watch aired, Martin Denham would end his own life, leaving behind a note that read, Please don't worry. If there is ghosts, I will now be one. And I will always be with you as one. Come on. I don't pay them, but come on. Ghost Watch was created to provide a viewing experience that was as realistic as possible. And unfortunately, in this case, what? it succeeded a little too well. I mean, thus causing the show to be banned from broadcast in the UK, where it has never aired since. UK, y'all been on some Though today, shit. you can still find the full movie across various streaming services, where despite the terrible, unfortunate tragedy that entailed, it's still renowned as an integral part of horror history, while simultaneously being remembered as one of the darkest moments in television history.
Now, Martin. R.I.P. to him. I mean, I have been scared by many things that I've watched, many movies and, and, and things like that. But but they said he already had some mental issues, so I'll just leave that alone. But that, that was pretty wild. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it looks really fake. But maybe I only have that perception because, you know, this type of stuff has evolved over time and I guess it become, you know, more believable. So I'm able to, to spot, you know, when things are fake, especially when it comes to, like, horror and stuff like I'm very familiar with <laughs> the genre so it's just very easy to tell when one stuff is not real but yeah I guess he wasn't able to detect that so he was affected by it RIP to everybody in this comp who lost their lives definitely some dark stuff and the fact that some of this still aired is crazy I mean that last one it aired first so you know that wasn't the issue but that Jenny Jones episode, I mean, he said that the guy killed uh, his friend before it even aired, but I mean, we got footage of it like they eventually aired it or something, so I'm a little confused by that, but they say, fuck it, we gonna air it anyway and eventually aired it? If so, that's pretty messed up. But yeah, this video was definitely dark. Y'all let me know what y'all think. Let me know what other videos you've been watching. I'll see y'all in the next one. Bye!